Hello everybody and welcome back to Dollar Tree Dinners and I have a special episode today. The day of this upload is Friday, March 8th, which is also International Women's Day. In celebration of this, I wanna do a video to commemorate my grandmother, Mary. My grandmother was one of the sweetest, kindest people that I probably have ever known. And she raised my dad, who also was one of the kindest people that I have ever known. And I attribute a lot of myself to my dad and my grandmother. My grandmother passed away back in 2014. She was born in 1924. So she passed away at 90 years old. In 1944, she gave birth to my dad. My grandfather was drafted into World War II. He made it through World War II. He didn't pass away until 2002. And then my dad passed away in 2004. One of my biggest regrets was not having asked my grandparents more about their life, but I was a teenager. I was a young child. I had more interest than asking them questions, and I do regret that to this day. I would love to be able to sit down with her today as an adult and ask her so many questions about the Great Depression and World War II and her experience growing up. I really wish I had that opportunity now. So today I'm making dinner from World War II. All of the recipes that I'm gonna be sharing came from this cookbook. This is Grandma's Wartime Kitchen, World War II, and The Way We Cooked. And I have been reading this book nonstop since the day I got it. It is filled with so much information about the wartime efforts, the rationing program, alternatives to things. It's a lot of why, and I'm a big why person. So it's not just a collection of recipes, but it's a collection of information related to life back during World War II. And I think it is a fantastic resource and it's definitely one of the best cookbooks I've ever purchased. So I picked out a handful of recipes, a main course, two sides, a bread and a dessert. And that's what we're gonna be making today. The main course is gonna be baked meatloaf potatoes. For our sides, I'm gonna be doing cream of onion soup and buttered peas. The bread is gonna be some refrigerator rolls. They call them refrigerator sticky buns, but we'll go over that here in a second. And then for dessert, I am gonna be making a cobbler. The only recipe that technically is not in this book is buttered peas. It does mention buttered peas. There is a segment at the beginning with a few example dinner menus. And I wanted to recreate one of these, but none of the three that they have referenced have all of the recipes throughout the book. So I wasn't able to recreate any of these from this book directly. So the buttered peas came from one of these sample dinner menus, but I definitely cherry picked the other recipes that I chose. Over the course of the video, I will be reading some excerpts from this book as well, because I think there's a lot of really fun information specific to the lifestyle and the women of World War II. So without further ado, let's go and jump right in. So first let's talk about the dinner rolls because I did have to start those last night. Specific to these dinner rolls, it's actually sticky buns or more like cinnamon rolls, but it says this recipe was a treasure to war workers used for pleasing their family with homemade yeast breads. The buns could be prepared, ready for their last rising and refrigerated while the cook went off to work. When she returned 10 hours later, they were ready to bake and serve. And without the cinnamon filling and sticky topping, this dough could also be made into a dozen different shapes of dinner rolls. And we continue to make them to this day. I didn't make the filling or topping. I'm just using the dinner roll recipe. And I did prep those last night so that they're chilling in my fridge because I don't have a 10 hour factory shift to get to. So what I did last night was I prepared the dough. It says to heat two thirds of a cup of milk in a small saucepan over medium heat until bubbles form around the edge of the pan. Then we're supposed to stir in one third of a cup of vegetable shortening, two tablespoons of brown sugar, and a half teaspoon of salt. Pour this mixture into a large bowl and set it aside to cool to between 105 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, combine a quarter cup of warm water with one packet of active dry yeast and set this aside for the yeast to soften. When the milk mixture has cooled, beat in the egg and yeast mixture, then add three and a half cups of flour and stir until a soft dough forms. Turn the dough out onto a work surface floured with some of the remaining flour need for five minutes adding as much of the flour as necessary to make the dough manageable what i will say about this dough is it was beautiful and soft and it was really easy to make i'm hoping that the dinner rolls turn out good then you place the dough in a greased bowl cover and set in a warm place until double in size i used a pizza pan to cover my bowl they wouldn't have had plastic wrap back then and i didn't have any clean kitchen towels as far as a warm place to set it, I did just kind of set it in my microwave, but in your oven works as well as long as the heat isn't turned on. Then I cut this into 16 equal pieces and I rolled each one into a ball. I put it in a greased baking dish and I set it in my fridge to chill overnight. And this is what they're looking like the next day. It does say to unwrap the buns and place in the cold oven 
Then turn on the oven to 350 degrees, bake for 25 to 30 minutes or until golden brown and the buns sound hollow when tapped on top. So this is something that I actually do quite often, especially when I have something cold out of the fridge. I do put it in my oven and then I turn my oven on so that as the oven comes up to temperature, it's kind of bringing these ingredients up to temperature. So this is something that I do pretty regularly anyways. So into the oven they go. Then preheat to 350. So while those are baking, I'm gonna get started on my main course, which are the baked meatloaf potatoes. So that's page 115. So for this, it calls for four large baking potatoes. The bag of potatoes that I got didn't really have large potatoes in them. So I think I'm gonna end up using six medium ones. I'll start with the four biggest ones. And then if I need to use the medium ones too, I can. It says that the flavor of the beef filling permeates these baked potatoes, making a big meal from a little bit of ground meat. So it calls for a half pound of ground beef, then some chopped bell pepper, chopped celery, chopped onion, salt, pepper, shortening, flour, milk, and celery leaves. Those ingredients are to make a gravy to go on top of the meatloaf potatoes. It doesn't specify to bake the potatoes in advance. It says four large baking potatoes scrubbed. And then it says you're supposed to hollow them out to make a boat, finely chop the potato that was removed. And it says to bake until the potatoes are tender, which leads me to believe that this starts with raw potatoes but I feel like that's gonna be quite difficult. We're gonna give it a shot though. That is my best interpretation of this recipe. I can certainly say that I have never hollowed out a raw potato before. So I'm curious to see how easy or difficult this is gonna be. And then hopefully, I feel like a melon baller would be the best tool for this, but I'm gonna try to, this is quite difficult. Yeah, this is definitely, not that easy. <laughs> Probably gonna get a bowl of water to keep these in so they don't turn brown. I feel like it's gonna take me a while to hollow out these six potatoes. Okay, so that wasn't terrible. One down. One of the things that I have learned throughout the process of trying some of these vintage recipes is that yes, you would probably in today's era want to bake the potato first. But if we're considering the 1940s, they didn't have microwaves back then, so it wouldn't have been quick and easy to bake a potato, and they probably didn't want to run unnecessary heat from their oven to pre-bake the potato. So I can definitely see why it would have been done this way, but from a modern perspective, I think it would be easier to do a meatloaf twice baked potato than to try to hollow out a raw potato. I am only gonna do four cause that is a lot of work and I accidentally got a little overzealous on this last potato and I accidentally carved a little bit through the skin, but I'm just gonna cover that up with a piece of potato. and Hopefully it should be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. And now I need to chop some peppers, celery and onions. It says about a quarter cup of each. So there are my pepper, celery, and onion mixture. And then I do also need to finely dice this potato filling. I'm not gonna be precise with any of it. All right, so we've got our peppers, celery, onion, now our diced potato. And we're gonna add in half a pound of ground beef. Season this with salt and pepper and mix that all together like a meatloaf. Now we're gonna stuff the potatoes, spoon the mixtures into hollows of potatoes, mounding on top. There's our prepped baked meatloaf potatoes. It's been 20 minutes, but the rolls are definitely brown on top and they do sound hollow. So I'm gonna let those cool. And let's see, we can go ahead and get our potatoes in the oven, 400 degrees. So increase the oven temperature to 400. Let's go ahead and pop in those potatoes, which it says to bake for about an hour. The next recipe is the soup, which is cream of onion soup. It's actually one of the very first recipes 
in the book and part of my inspiration for this dinner because I just want to try it. So it says, this is a quick and easy addition to a dinner menu that's a good way to increase the amount of milk in the family's diet with little notice. Although fresh milk prices were sometimes high, it was usually available and not included in the rationing programs that regulated most other protein sources. So this calls for bacon, onions, flour, milk, salt, and pepper. Really simple. We gotta chop a bunch of onions. It says three cups of onions. So I'm probably gonna need about three onions total. It also says to slice um, four slices of bacon cut into one inch pieces. I got the cheapest bacon that I could. This was around like $3.84. So four slices cut into one inch pieces. So we're gonna saute our bacon until crisp. I have a feeling that I should have gotten thick cut bacon rather than kind of more traditional bacon that we buy today. I feel like what they got back in the 40s would have been more of a thick cut. So maybe I should have used eight slices because I'm not really getting a whole lot of fat here. Right. Got a little crispy there. Let's go ahead and take that out. Trying to reuse bowls as much as I can so I don't have a bunch of dishes to clean after this. Do have some fat, but again, not a lot. I'm gonna cheat a little bit and add some of my stores. As you guys know, I always keep bacon fat on the ready. I'll throw in like an extra tablespoon or so. Along with our three cups of chopped onions. And then we're supposed to cook that down until the onions start to brown. I'm trying to deglaze the bottom of the pan a little bit too, get off some of that good bacon flavor. So now we add in two tablespoons of flour and mix that to make sure that the onions are fully coated. This is essentially like making any sort of a cream soup or gravy. And now we're gonna go in with four cups of milk, a little bit at a time. This is gonna get seasoned with salt and pepper. And then it really just says to kind of let this thicken up as much as you want to. I'm gonna move it to a back burner though so I can get started on the peas. Now it doesn't mention how the peas should be prepared so I'm just gonna boil them. It says buttered peas but butter was one of the rationed ingredients. So I'm thinking that I should boil them and then top them with butter at the dinner table when they're served. I'm really proud of my time management right now because we've got the soup ready, the rolls are ready, the peas just went on the burner, the meatloaf potatoes still have 27 minutes left which gives me time to prep the dessert so that, that can go in the oven after the meatloaf potatoes are done. Now remember, this would have all been done after a 10 hour factory shift, which leads me into another excerpt from this book. The government produced and encouraged businesses to sponsor pamphlets, articles, and posters that gave the home front housewife all the advice she needed to work a 10 hour defense plant shift, come home to serve a nutritious meal on an impeccably set table for her family, have the kitchen spotless in no time, and in the morning look absolutely perky as she handed each family member a hearty lunch before she started the next long day. But yeah, let's go ahead and get started on the dessert then because we still have 25 minutes left on the potatoes. And like I said, we're doing a cobbler. This is on page 161 and it is a blueberry cobbler, but I have strawberries. So I'm gonna use the strawberries that I have. Use what you got. The motto of the Great Depression and World War II. So it says, 
Fruit-based desserts such as this cobbler became popular because of the seasonal fruit filling created most of the dessert and then a thin layer of cake, biscuit, or pastry on top only required a little precious fat. It also talks throughout the book about how granulated sugar was rationed and oftentimes brown sugar, honey, maple syrup, or things like that were used as a substitute. So this calls for brown, brown sugar as did the dinner rolls. It also mentions that brown sugar was less expensive than refined white sugar. But yeah, I think we can go ahead and get this dessert prepped. I'm really proud of how well this is going. I did not expect this to kind of come together all at one time. So kudos to me for that. Cause I usually am like a one dinner kind of person, not like a main, two sides, a bread and a dessert. That is a lot of cooking to be done every night. So for this dessert, it says two cups of fresh or frozen blueberries. I am gonna be using strawberries. Cause again, it's what I have into a eight inch square baking dish combine with two tablespoons of brown sugar, one tablespoon of cornstarch, which is pretty much all the cornstarch I have left in this container. And then it says to combine those spread out. Oh, I was supposed to grease the pan. Oops. Oh, well too late now. So spread that out onto the bottom Then combine one and a quarter cup of flour the rest of the brown sugar. So it says a half cup of brown sugar, less the two tablespoons. There's a little shy of a half cup. So less the two tablespoons. Baking powder, two teaspoons. Quarter teaspoon of salt. Now we're supposed to cut in a quarter cup of shortening. I grew up making biscuits with shortening, not butter. So let's cut that in. Now we're supposed to add a half cup of milk, one egg, and two teaspoons of vanilla. Look who's on top of their vanilla game today, which you'll only understand that reference if you saw my Polish recipe video <laughs> with the yeast cake. I still have intentions to try more Polish recipes. I just haven't gotten to it. The next one is the cheese cookies. That's still on my list. It says to stir this until just combined. It says to spoon it, but mine's pretty pourable. So I'm just gonna pour it over top of our fruit. And then I'm gonna leave that on standby until I'm ready to bake it, which is gonna be after the baked potato meatloaf is done. But there is still 14 minutes on the meatloaf potatoes and there is still technically one more step to go, which is the gravy for the potatoes, which is really just a country gravy. So it says to melt shortening over medium heat, stir in flour, gradually stir in milk, salt and pepper. It recommends some celery leaves or parsley leaves and then keep, keep warm until potatoes are tender. Today is all about dirtying every single pot that I own it seems, but that's okay. Two tablespoons of vegetable shortening. And melt that over medium to medium high heat. And we're gonna go in with three tablespoons of flour. And it also says to add salt here and then stir until smooth. Gradually add in one and a quarter cups of milk. doesn't call for pepper in this, but it calls for celery leaves or parsley. Since I already bought the celery to make the meatloaf, I figured celery leaves were a good use. I'm gonna try that for the first time. I can definitely say that I've never eaten the leafy part of the celery before. 
So there's some of my chopped celery leaves. And then that's just gonna stay warm until the potatoes are done, which is only about six minutes from now. So that is our, what do they call these? Um, baked meatloaf potatoes. So that's our baked meatloaf potatoes after an hour in the oven. We'll let the oven cool down a little bit because I need to bake the cobbler at 350. Time to plate up our World War II dinner, starting with our cream of onion soup. Next, we have some peas. Which I am going to top with a pat of butter. A couple of our dinner rolls and one of our potatoes, which we have a gravy type of sauce to go on the potato. And the cobbler is in the oven. That's gonna take about 30 minutes or so, but this is a complete dinner from World War II. I think it looks pretty good. I'm excited. Before I try anything, I wanna cut into this potato and see what the cross section looks like. Okay. Actually, that's not bad. We got a good bit of meat filling in there. Definitely do see how this would be a good way to stretch a half a pound of ground beef to feed a family of four, but I'm excited to try it. I think it's gonna be great. I also almost forgot that some of the bacon pieces are supposed to be a topping for the cream of onion soup. So that is technically the complete dinner, less the dessert. I am so hungry and I'm very excited to try this. I'm gonna start with the soup actually. So the cream of onion soup which I did taste a little bit while I was cooking because you have to taste it, make sure that the seasoning is good. The onion really cooks down and makes this incredibly sweet soup. It is actually really good. I think I would like it a little bit better with some potatoes in it, just for a little bit more bite because the broth is really good, the onions are really good, but the onions are very soft and tender. So the soup itself doesn't really have much texture. And so I think I would enjoy it a little bit more if there was something to kind of bite into, like some chunks of potato. Next we have our main course, which is our meatloaf potato. I feel like I should have probably done, it did say 60 to 70 minutes, and maybe I should have gone closer to 70. I'm trying to get a whole chunk of everything, potato, meatloaf, and gravy. I think we have a little bit of everything. I think the most unique part of this is that kind of white gravy sauce on top as opposed to anything else, brown gravy, ketchup. I didn't expect it to have a white gravy on top, but it's actually really good. The meatloaf portion was just seasoned with salt and pepper, but it's got a lot of natural flavors from the vegetables that we put in there, namely the bell peppers and the celery. The meat and potato filling is actually really good, even though we didn't do a whole lot to it. I think it's got a really great flavor, so, and I think it pairs really well with that kind of gravy. I'm gonna dice up some of this potato and put it in my cream of onion soup to see if that's what I feel like the soup is kind of missing. Since I have some extra potato, I think we can doctor it up just a little bit. Let's try that. That was perfect. Really all it needed was just a little bit of texture, something to kind of bite into, something to make it feel a little bit more hearty, to me at least. But I do really like this meatloaf with white gravy. That is not something I would have ever contemplated. Our peas are just plain old boiled peas with a little bit of butter. Butter was one of the ration ingredients that was hard to come by during World War II, so they would have used butter sparingly, more as like a dinner table addition than to use it in cooking. And then as far as the last part of our dinner goes, we have our homemade dinner rolls. And again, you can use a little bit of butter on those, but back in World War II, they wouldn't have used much. I probably will end up dipping it in the soup more. 
I love bread of any kind, especially like a fresh baked dinner roll. This one's really good. It's soft. It doesn't have a very strong flavor. Um, I tend to like my rolls a little bit more on the sweet side, like with like a honey butter or something on top of them. But these are lovely. They're soft and chewy. They have a nice texture to them. They're airy. A little bit of butter goes a long way. Um, I am going to dip them in the soup though, because that's, I love, I love having bread and soup to be able to dip the bread in the soup. Mm. Absolutely splendid. And of course we still have dessert. And there's our cobbler out of the oven and it says to let this cool for 15 minutes before serving. And it says this serves six. It's probably gonna be closer to four for my household. I should have cooked it maybe five additional minutes. It does say 30 to 35 minutes, but it does look a little doughy just directly in the center, but the outer edges look perfectly cooked and fine. I wanna say before I try the cobbler that I've not only had a lot of fun making this dinner, it was quite time consuming. I wanna say I probably started this process two to three hours ago, but it's been a really great learning experience. I've enjoyed the process and I enjoyed the meal. It's the type of meal that makes me kind of sad that I don't have a big family to cook for because I would love to be able to make big dinners like I did here, but we're only two people, so there's only so much that we can eat. But the idea of making fresh baked bread and a main course and a couple of sides and a dessert, it's just, it's so appealing to me and I wish I had more I wish I had a family to cook for so I could do it more often. But let's dig into our strawberry cobbler. There are a few recipes in the book that involve whipped cream of some kind and usually they're unsweetened whipped cream. And I feel like this would benefit from some whipped cream or some ice cream, of course, as usual. The cobbler topping, because it was made with brown sugar, almost has like a cookie flavor to it, like a sugar cookie. It would definitely be perfect with some whipped cream or some ice cream. I think this was an interesting look in history and I really enjoyed the recipes that I made. I really enjoyed this whole process, including the reading and researching leading up to this video. I'm sad that it's over, but I am exhausted and I now have a kitchen to clean. I definitely think that we succeeded on the nutritious meal part of it, not so much the impeccably set table. The kitchen will not be spotless in no time. The kitchen will probably not even be spotless until tomorrow morning. And I absolutely will not look perky while I do it. But the meal was the success and that was good enough for me. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day and I will see you again soon.